Hi, welcome back everyone. I would now like to introduce you to Rafael Perez Escamilla, Professor of Public Health and Director of the Office of Public Health Practice, the Global Health Concentration and the Maternal Child Health Track at the Yale School of Public Health. Dr. Perez Escamilla's mixed methods research programs have helped advance evidence-based maternal, infant, and young child, child feeding programs globally. He has published over 280 peer-reviewed articles, has delivered over 350 lectures across all world regions, and is an, is an elected member of the USA National Academy of Medicine. He has been a senior maternal child health and nutrition and food security advisor to various organizations, UNICEF, the WHO, Robert Wood Johnson, just to name a few, and governments across the world. Um, so today he's going to be presenting Making Breastfeeding Work in the 21st Century, a Global per Perspective. And again, there will be a few minutes for questions at the end of the presentation, so you can enter your questions in the Q&A box as he's presenting. So without further ado, thank you so much for your time today, Dr. Perez Escamilla, and I'm going to hand things over to you. Thank you so very much, uh, Laura, for your kind introduction. And I cannot express the enormous gratitude that I have uh, to Anne Mirwood for all the work that she does and for having given me a special place in this virtual conference. So for you to understand where my philosophy regarding the work that I do on breastfeeding protection, promotion, and support comes from, it is important to first and foremost clarify that currently the vast majority of women in the world are choosing to breastfeed. And secondly, the fact that among them, the great majority don't breastfeed for as long as they would like to. So the focus of my research for over three decades now has been as to why this is the case and what can we do about it. At the end of the day, it is obvious that it is the women's right to choose how to feed a, her baby, but it is also her right uh, to breastfeed for as long as she wants to when she chooses to do so. And that is the main focus audience that I try to target with all the research and evaluation and co-design work that I do in the area of breastfeeding protection, promotion, and uh, support. So first of all, there is no doubt that from a public health perspective, breastfeeding is the best source of nutrition eh, for infants, and that breastfeeding offers a constellation of health benefits, not only to babies, but also to their mothers. So when we're talking about a eh, a feeding choice that reduces ear and respiratory infections, reduces the risk of gastrointestinal infections, reduces the risk of sudden infant death syndrome, reduces the risk uh, of asthma as well as of the onset of obesity. Obviously, we're talking about a hugely important topic from the point of view of pediatric public health. When we also realize that as more evidence accumulates, it is becoming clearer and clearer that the life history of breastfeeding of a woman it protects her against the risk of high blood pressure, type 2 diabetes, and certain uh, cancers such as breast and ovarian cancer, we start to realize that we are really talking about a very, very important behavior that deserves to be fully promoted, protected, and, and supported. The evidence is also very clear that the optimal uh, breastfeeding behaviors, according to the World Health Organization and the Academy, American Academy of Pediatrics, is for babies to be exclusively 
breastfed throughout the first uh, six months of life. And once complementary foods, obviously healthy, nutrition, safe complementary foods are introduced at around six months for them to continue breastfeeding for at least one year, according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, or for at least two years, according to the World Health Organization. So it is very clear, not only that uh, there are hundreds, if not thousands of studies supporting the maternal child uh, health benefits of, uh, uh, of breastfeeding, but also it is uh, very clear that uh, the consensus on optimal breastfeeding behaviors has been, has been reached both globally and uh, within, within the US. So at the end of the day, we also know that because of the lack of global investments in breastfeeding, the world is losing about $1 billion every single, every single day because these babies, there's a very large number of babies that are not actually receiving the benefits of breastfeeding because we're not doing enough to allow their mothers uh, to facilitate the mothers for, from doing so. It's also very important that this uh, health economic analysis don't come only from lower income countries, but the elegant work from uh, Melissa Bartik and colleagues has clearly shown that the economic benefits also apply to high income countries, including uh, the US, where current breastfeeding rates result in almost 5,000 excess cases of breast cancer, almost 54,000 excess cases of hypertension, and 14,000 cases of myocardial in infection. And this is a cost of $17.4 billion to society resulting from premature from premature death. So regarding this conference, I know uh, many of you are from the US or work in the US. So keep in mind that everything we discuss today is as relevant to the US as to any other part of the world. And this is why the World Health Organization uh, since 2010 pretty much issued the strongest level of support that it can give for endorsing a public health recommendation. Essentially, they refer to breastfeeding as one of the most cost-effective preventive measures to improve maternal child health and development. That statement uh, was totally supported by the evidence reviewed by the Lancet Breastfeeding Series authors in 2016 and by the work of Melissa Bartik published in Maternal Child Nutrition in 2017. So then a key question becomes, uh, number one, given that the vast majority of women want to breastfeed and the majority of them cannot breastfeed for as long as they want, and the fact that we know the enormous economic losses that countries are experiencing because moms are not being able to breastfeed for as long as they want, then why we are not having more success at protecting, promoting, and a uh, and marketing breast and supporting breastfeeding on a large scale. So some years ago with funding from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, my research team at Yale undertook the challenge of trying to identify through a massive a systematic review plus interviews with key informant, which were the key ingredients that could make the breastfeeding engine to work at a national level based on successful case studies. What we learned essentially was synthesized into what we called the breastfeeding gear model. And in every successful country, everything started with very strong evidence-based advocacy by a small group of concerned citizens that oftentimes included members from civil society organizations, pediatricians, obstetricians, and or academicians as well. IPFAN and WABA obviously are two organizations that represent best practices with regards to evidence-based advocacy. 
this advocacy in turn was fundamental for leading to the political will that is required for countries uh, to pass legislation and policies that first of all are crucial for protecting uh, the breastfeeding choices that women make by strengthening uh, maternity benefits as well as the implementation of the World Health Organization code uh, for marketing of breast milk substitutes. It is also essential, these legislations and policies are essential for releasing the resources that in turn are needed for properly building the workforce and delivering effectively facility-based and community-based breastfeeding protection, promotion, and support uh, programs. The countries that have been successful have also invested in behavior change uh, communication campaigns, and they have also invested in implementation uh, science research to truly understand uh, how to improve or how to maintain the high quality of delivery of these uh, programs at a national level. And this cannot happen, this has not happened in any country unless there is a national uh, coordinating unit that is empowered uh, with a mandate and with funding to actually establish uh, and monitor the attainment of the goals and to really allow for the different gears that are needed for this engine to work to communicate properly in good coordination uh, with each other and to actually to address challenges as they appear and not uh, to find about them until the program has failed. So in terms of, of my, my global research, what we then did was to actually get funding from the family Larson Rosenquist Foundation to develop the indicators or benchmarks to assess the strengths or weaknesses of each of the gears in the breastfeeding gear model. And this is what became the Becoming Breastfeeding Friendly uh, index that uh, has been detailed in the maternal child nutrition paper that you can see on, on the screen. And what is very important is that the BBF initiative, as we affectionately call it, is not only a stupid number or, or a stupid index, but actually developing that number, developing that index requires a mo several months long process that is run by a highly interdisciplinary uh, multi-sectoral uh, committee through a series of meetings, not only to reach consensus on the scores based on evidence, but also to reach consensus on the policy recommendations that they want to make uh, to the governments for them to actually be able to enable more the environments that women need to implement their uh, breastfeeding their breastfeeding choices. So the process as to how the BBF uh, 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 process runs is actually detailed also on the paper that you can see at the bottom of, uh, of, uh, of the screen. At the end of that process, uh, the committees that have been in conversations with the policymakers present very tangible, very implementable, actionable, recommendations that uh, at a very high level, very visible event that has a lot of participation from the media and uh, other key other key stakeholders. I am very pleased uh, to report that the BBF initiative has already been implemented in eight countries across five world regions. It has been implemented uh, three times in Mexico. It has been implemented twice in Ghana and once in Samoa, in Myanmar, Germany, as well as in three nations from uh, Great Britain. And what we have really uh, learned is first of all, that the BBF process works that the governments have not only embraced it and become a part of it, but they have taken ownership of it. And we have also learned that it facilitated for the first time an inter 
a sectorial a dialogue that includes uh, several ministries and sub-ministries of government, but also includes civil society organizations. It includes academicians and oftentimes international agencies such as UNICEF, WHO, and Save the Children. What we have learned is that country after country after country that is implementing BBF, they have acknowledged that we really need to think about a social ecological model to make breastfeeding work in the 21st century. And all the countries have made very specific recommendations about increasing coverage and quality of both the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative as well as community-based counseling. And they have also issued very specific recommendations about ways to strengthen maternity protection for women working in both the formal and informal sector, and also on how to better enforce the WHO code. So I will now talk to you about uh, three areas uh, that they have identified where investments, the evidence tells us that investments can have an impact on making them work much better. So I will first address together baby friendly as well as peer counseling. And lastly, I will talk about maternity protection policies. So as we all know, eh, not too long ago, the BFHI celebrated its eh, 25th anniversary. And thankfully, WHO had the wisdom that instead of just gathering the world to celebrate and have a party and everybody goes home to actually re reflect heavily as to why, in spite of all the efforts, eh, after 25 years, still less than 10% of the babies in the world were being born in baby-friendly hospitals. What they discovered was that eh, for many countries, it had become a very difficult uh, to sustain the financing of the accreditation process for a, a number of reasons, including the strong reliance on international agencies uh, to do so. International agencies cannot do it forever. So the governments didn't really take ownership of it. And as a result, it started falling apart in, in many places. Uh, other reasons were very much related to a highly demanding uh, training, a little bit inflexible in terms of how it had to be delivered, and it, really the logistics of keeping the pipeline of the workforce. If you remember, one of the, the main uh, gears addresses the whole issue of, of workforce development was very, very difficult to keep it going. So that consultation that followed really led to a full revision on how best to implement the baby friendly hospital initiative that was launched in 2018 and i am currently supporting many countries all over the world on actually how to adapt these guidelines to the local the local context so there are still 10 steps uh, they have been broken down now into critical management uh, procedures and what they call clinical uh, procedures. So first and foremost, it is now imperative that they, the facilities comply fully with the international code. Uh, it is also imperative to continue having the written infant feeding policy in place, but now they have added that it is imperative to have ongoing monitoring and data management systems. Without these management information systems, it was becoming impossible to really understand how to improve the quality of the baby-friendly hospitals while they had while they had been accredited. Secondly, the training requirement continues, but if you read the document, there is now much more flexibility on the modality in which it can be delivered, eh, online, eh, eh, practice-based, eh, better uh, a hybrid approach, but also the possibility of moving a lot of this training into the pre-training phase. That is when the healthcare professionals are going to the university, in medical schools, nursing schools, midwifery schools, and, and so on. With regards to the clinical practices, 
uh, steps, uh, the emphasis on the prenatal uh, management of breastfeeding uh, continues. Uh, and also step four has very strongly become a skin to skin contact step. Before it was mainly an early breastfeeding step, but now it has been taken to the next level. And this really is calling for skin to skin contact, which of course, if it happens, will lead to an early initiation of, uh, of breastfeeding. The expectation that women will not only be educated, but will be receiving support. So breast is best message is not enough. The vast majority of women in the world know it, and that's what they choose to breastfeed. But it is how to deal, how to anticipate some problems uh, with breastfeeding that if they are not dealt on time can lead to major lactational management problems down the road. There is a very strong emphasis on not using anything other than breastfeeding or human milk eh, when there is no medical reason to do eh, to do so. A BFHI cannot function without rooming in for 28 hours. And the previous step that was to breastfeed on demand, it has now really become um, a, a responsive feeding a, a, a recommendation. And this has also allowed for baby friendly hospitals, for example, in the UK, to accommodate uh, not only women who breastfeed, but if a woman chooses to formula feed, uh, you know, this step very much applies to working with that mom also on issues related to responsive uh, bottle feeding. So uh, we can address that more during the question and answers period, but it is an important change from from uh, in guidance from BFHI. Uh, and uh, finally, we can go all the way down to step 10, which is by far the most difficult one to implement. And that is the link with community-based uh, uh, breastfeeding support or breastfeeding counseling. Uh, I was very proud to lead the systematic review that supported a lot of the revisions and the continuation of the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative globally, our review showed that the 10 steps do have a positive impact on short-term, medium-term, and longer-term breastfeeding outcomes. It also showed a dose response relationship between the number of BFHI steps that women are exposed to and the likelihood of improved breastfeeding outcomes. And very importantly, we documented how crucial step 10 is key for sustaining the short-term breastfeeding benefits obtained from the baby-friendly uh, hospital initiative. It, it is remarkable the work that CHAMPS under the leadership of Anne Mirwood has done in the southern part of the US where it has been shown that the baby-friendly hospital initiative can not only uh, improve uh, breastfeeding initiation, exclusive breastfeeding uh, for all, but also how it has been able to decrease disparities in breastfeeding initiation when comparing African American uh, with uh, with white uh, with white infants. So this project has clearly shown that when it comes to proper implementation, compliance with the ten steps uh, uh, go up. Community-based organizations engage more also with the, with the initiative. And at the end of the day, you can actually see improvements not only on breastfeeding initiation, but also in exclusive breastfeeding practices in, in the hospitals. The, you can see how incredibly remarkable was the increase in the proportion of rooming in that has happened in these hospitals as a result of the CHAMPS project. With regards uh, to step 10, uh, this is perhaps the best study that has ever been conducted in the world by Coutinho and colleagues in Northeastern Brazil. And what they did was first to measure what happened with uh, breastfeeding, exclusive breastfeeding rates comparing with a proposed design uh, what those rates were before the implementation of a baby friendly happen and then compare with what happened with those exclusive breastfeeding rates after implementation. So the salmon bar here is before interven in the intervention and the orange and blue are post baby friendly implementation. And then what they did, they were randomly assigned women to receive 
uh, peer counseling home visits or not after hospital discharge. So the experimental group is that in blue and the remarkable finding that they show is that in order to sustain the very short-term benefits of baby friendly uh, hospital on exclusive breastfeeding behaviors, it, the, it is very important to continue the breastfeeding support in their homes or in the community. By six months postpartum, uh, there were no longer differences in exclusive breastfeeding rates among mothers who deliver in the baby-friendly hospital, but that uh, did not receive the home visits compared to the bre exclusive breastfeeding rates before the hospital became baby-friendly. So this is a very powerful illustration of why step 10 is so important, but also so complex to implement. And we also find a very similar a strength of findings with regards to our own breastfeeding peer counseling a program in Connecticut that is called Breastfeeding a Heritage and Pride. And under the leadership of Professor Alex Anderson, we conducted a, a randomized a trial where the standard of care was a regular enrollment in a, a breastfeeding a counseling program a, after a, delivering a, or as part of the maternity care in a baby-friendly hospital or to experimental group who received additional strong support prenatally, perinatally, and postnatally very much focusing on exclusive breastfeeding. And as you can see, there was a, almost a 20-fold increase on the likelihood of exclusive breastfeeding at three months as a result of this comprehensive intervention that really it was very, very aligned with the spirit of the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative is step 10. So I also was very happy to have been invited to serve in the first uh, breastfeeding counseling guideline uh, uh, issued by the World Health Organization. And this is very important also in relationship to step 10, because what this uh, guideline recommends based uh, on evidence is that all pregnant women and mothers with young children should receive uh, breastfeeding counseling in both the antenatal period and postnatally at least six times uh, and additionally as needed and as early as possible uh, after the delivery of the baby and should include at least one observation by a counselor of the mother latching on the baby, as we know many of the problems uh, with early lactation that become huge later on are related to poor positioning or, or latching. We strongly endorsed face-to-face -face, uh, counseling, although we recognize that it can be supplemented with uh, telehealth technologies. And we have done some interesting research during COVID-19 as to how to be able to do uh, uh, to, to do that. At the end of the day, we are seeing through the systems thinking lens, the breastfeeding uh, peer counseling and other peer counseling programs as representing a way to offer a well integrated uh, continuum of care of, of breastfeeding for all mothers all over the world. So our BHP, Breastfeeding Heritage and Pride program is actually a very nice illustration as to how you can integrate uh, community-based uh, programs with health facility-based programs to really develop a seamless uh, continuum of breastfeeding care for, we focus on, especially on low-income, very, very vulnerable women. So, uh, we also uh, strongly endorse the principle of anticipatory guidance, given how well we understand uh, the lactation management issues that most women are going to be likely to face. So if I can uh, sum up what was the most important change from prior to uh, 2018 uh, to starting in 2018 is that for the first time, the Baby Friendly Hospital Initiative was really moved into a systems a, a analysis framework, into a systems thinking framework, where instead of thinking about one hospital at a time, we're now thinking about how to reform a, the whole healthcare system 
including the community-based aspects of that system. So if you think about the PROBI trial, uh, you know, the was not only working with the uh, hospitals where the babies were delivered, but also with the polyclinics serving uh, those babies before and once during pre during prenatally and also postpartum. You know, all the pedi pedi pediatrics visits, uh, all those pediatricians and staff were heavily trained also on baby friendly representing uh, the step 10. We saw what happened uh, with Coutinho's uh, study in, in Brazil. So this is going to require a much, much better management information systems, uh, really applying the gear model, keeping in mind the heart of that model, which is the coordination gear, and keeping in mind that we do have best practices recommendations that are available to the world. And it's uh, very much uh, backed up by very, very strong evidence, including the 10 steps, breastfeeding counseling, and the meaning and ways to implement uh, the code to make sure that the environments can truly be enabled without major obstacles for women to implement their right and their choice to breastfeed for as long as they want. So in the US, it is fantastic uh, that baby-friendly facilities have increased dramatically. Uh, for all of you guys involved with CHAMPS, you should feel very proud that Mississippi leads the way. I know it is not an accident. I know you have had a lot to do with it. And as a result, uh, the U.S. is one of the few countries where the baby-friendly initiative is going very strong. And almost 28% of the births annually now are happening in baby-friendly uh, hospitals. So we have seen a reflection probably of the combination of the strength of the baby-friendly hospital initiative with more investments on breastfeeding counseling through programs such as WIC, but also uh, other initiatives that are happening at the local and state levels. It is not surprising that in spite of all the forces uh, against breastfeeding in the country, the breastfeeding initiation rates continue to increase uh, dramatically. They, in 2015, they were already at 83%. There are still important inequities, but overall there have been important improvements in exclusive breastfeeding from 16% in 2009 to 25%, and also on breastfeeding continuation from 25% to 36%. So something good, something very interesting has happened and in the US, and I think we have been able to explain a bit of it in a recent paper based on really the premises behind the breastfeeding gear model. So now I will turn to the last part of the presentation, which is related to maternity protection uh, policies. Each of the countries that have implemented BBF has come up with very specific recommendations to strengthen maternity leave, uh, maternity protection policies. So first of all, paid maternity leave has been associated with improved breastfeeding outcomes as well as reductions in infant mortality. So our BBF uh, team uh, in strong partnership with the BBF team in Mexico has actually published a, an algorithm on how countries can use their own data, which is commonly available through fertility surveys, a workforce surveys, and so on, how to estimate how much it would cost the country per additional week of maternity leave, of paid maternity leave for women working in the formal sector. And the algorithm has been validated in Mexico and we have now also very fine results from Brazil and Ghana. So this three country paper, you can find it in the bulletin of the World Health Organization. Unfortunately, the US is the only high income country without federal paid maternity leave legislation. It is very sad that one in four women return to work by 10 days after giving birth in the country. And we need to keep in mind that we have to focus also on the fathers and the support they need to provide. So the International Labor Organization also recommends uh, that a paid leave is given to, uh, to the fathers. So uh, uh, we have also uh, recently a read a wonderful systematic review on breastfeeding at uh, the workplace that clearly shows that there are 
uh, uh, important interventions that can be implemented at the work site, including breaks during the workday, lactation rooms for breast milk expression, flexible work hours, and also affordable high quality childcare in proximity to the workplace. So again, it is not an excuse to don't do anything about protecting uh, the right that working women also have to, to breastfeed or use human milk for as long uh, as they want. We know uh, there are interventions that uh, have been implemented uh, successfully. And very importantly, it is key in the 21st century to take into account the maternity protection needs for women who are employed in the informal economy. The majority of women uh, uh, work in income generating activities globally and among women who work in low and middle income countries, the very great majority do so in the informal economy and they've had zero protection uh, with regards to maternity benefits. So we're very proud that the BBF uh, team has also developed uh, the algorithm uh, uh, to, for countries to estimate with their own data how much it would cost for them to provide a cash transfer to women employed in the informal economy. And uh, the work has now been replicated in full partnership with Alive and Thrive in Indonesia, as well as in the Philippines. And uh, there is no doubt that most middle income countries at least can afford to provide uh, such benefit to women working in the informal economy. And what is fascinating just two years ago, to two days, I'm sorry, two days ago, a senator in the Philippines who read this paper put in legislation to provide a cash transfer to all pregnant women who are low income in the Philippines. So this is really important in the 21st century to make breastfeeding work, to keep in mind that a very high proportion of women in low and middle income countries work in the informal economy. And of course, they're fully deserving also of a maternity protection uh, benefit. Finally, I do want uh, to end this section, I, I do want to mention that uh, I think on Friday, there's going to be a, a major event hosted by the World Health Organization to celebrate and reflect upon uh, the World Health organization code for marketing of breast milk substitutes. It is its 40th anniversary. And I would suggest as with the baby friendly hospital initiative, it is not just the time to celebrate, but also to reflect why it has been so difficult at enforcing the code all over the world. So when it is enforced, it can be effective, but unfortunately, there are very, very rare examples in the world of countries that have been successful at enforcing the code because of the major uh, power, economic power, political power, and so on, that the food industry has. And unfortunately, our own government in the US over the decades has played a very, very big role at really weakening and disenabling the ability of uh, our country and for other countries to enforce, to enforce the code. And we may want to get to more of this during the Q&A and a period, but obviously without a, a protecting a women and families against unethical a marketing of breast milk substitutes, it is very, very difficult. It will be very difficult to make further progress with regards to breastfeeding outcomes in the US and beyond. And I will conclude my presentation by highlighting the fact that in spite of all the knowledge that we have, in spite that in several countries, including the US, breastfeeding outcomes uh, continue to improve, the pace of improvement is not, the pace of improvement is not fast enough, and most importantly, strong breastfeeding inequities exist uh, within the countries. Uh, within the US, it is especially important to take into account that in the first uh, 21st century, still uh, ethnic racial minority women, especially Hispanic as well as, as black women are much less likely to be able to meet their uh, breastfeeding intentions or their breastfeeding goals than white women. So understanding how racism, bias and discrimination contribute to women not meeting their breastfeeding intentions is a very important priority 
that we should address to understand how to reduce breastfeeding inequities in the country. Uh, under the invitation of Anne Mirwood, myself, and Dan Selen, uh, coordinated a special issue in 2015 on equity in breastfeeding, and we fully brought to the papers that brought to the attention of the world the major need to address maternal employment, the major need to address the marketing of breast milk substitutes uh, companies, and the very heavy introduction of uh, prelactial feeds, as well as the needs of ethnic racial minority families, indigenous communities, LGBTQI families, as well as the inequities that happen during humanitarian emergencies. And I am very pleased that in a number of years later, we have an ongoing special supplement in the International Journal for Equity in Health, again, on interventions and policy approaches to promote equity in breastfeeding. 11 papers have already been posted. We have, I think, four more to go. But if you want to check it out, we have many countries, many topics represented, and very innovative approaches to understand how to better address inequities in low, middle, and high-income countries. In conclusion, breastfeeding and human milk is a major cost-saving intervention. In the 21st century, to make breastfeeding work, we need a much better integration of facility and community-based uh, breastfeeding uh, support. And we need much more family-friendly social and economic, uh, economic policies. Uh, we need to invest uh, much more in protection and learning how to better enforce the WHO code globally should be a big priority in these days and times of social media. Lots of the violations are happening that way. So let's all join forces to address breastfeeding inequities and social injustice up front. Thank you and cheers to all of you. Thank you, Dr. Perez Escamilla. Uh, now we're going to just start a Q&A session. Um, so the first question we have for you was how can we bring providers who are resistant to baby-friendly initiative on board? Especially those providers who are continuing to use outdated policies that harm early breastfeeding. So for instance, formula supplementation due to jaundice or low blood sugars. Yes, so I think it's a combination of the policies that the leadership in their institutions needs to put in writing and needs to emphasize. And it's also an issue of continuing education and, and, and retraining. Because if, if the policies are in place, but the providers are not offered the training, then it is not fair to expect that they are going to be able to implement, uh, implement a policy. If there is a policy and there is training in place and they're still resistant to it, I think, maybe time for them to start looking for another job. I, I, I really, this is very extreme, but I, I given the, the enormous uh, evidence behind the benefits of breastfeeding and the fact that many women who want to do so are being prevented from doing so through bad policies also in healthcare facilities, I, I think it is justifiable to think of important consequences uh, for intentional resistance to the policies. Yes, thank you. I know we've struggled with that too with the different hospitals we've, we've worked with. Um, it's definitely an issue. Um, so we have a specific question for you about the Brazilian study that you um, that you cited about home visits. And so someone was interested in how many home visits um, the mothers received and when. So I don't know if you know those details. I don't have that on top of my head, okay. <laughs> but the Lancet reference is there and, and okay. everything is explained. Uh, but as you saw, it went uh, on for six months, the postpartum visits. And typically there is more frequency the first month than the next month. But we can double check on the paper, yeah. Okay. I have, and, so and, this... and, and just the WHO guidance now is that mm -hmm. there should be at least six for all women, prenatally and postnatally, in like, you know, I think one prenatally, five postnatally, and then more as needed. Okay. Perfect. Um, this will just be our last question. So maybe just maybe one 
one kind of pearl of wisdom if you have about how to encourage private sectors, so hospitals, to take up, implement, and sustain baby friendly. Yes, I think we need to work with uh, health insurance companies. Uh, I think they are going to respond very nicely to fiscal incentives. Mm -hmm. So if there is a way for them to see that the better the breastfeeding outcomes, uh, the more reimbursements they're going to get, uh, the uh, you know, the more economic benefits uh, for the hospital are going to happen, then they will do it. Great, and we've actually seen that in Mississippi, and that was in our chat too, um, about how Blue Cross Blue Shield of Mississippi was um, involved with baby-friendly implementation in, in the state. So thank you again for, for your talk. Um, it was really fascinating. And so we are now going to transition over to the next session and um, I'm looking forward to hearing from Ken Harris. Thank you.